Well, good, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's webinar. First of all, I hope that everybody is um, well and not too badly affected by what's going on. I think we're all a bit uh, getting a bit of cabin fever uh, at the moment. Um, this evening's uh, talk is on art and the new evangelization. And we are very fortunate that Patrick van der Voorst has agreed to give it. Um, Patrick uh, initially studied law at the University of Louvain in Belgium and came to London in 1995. And he worked for 15 years for Sotheby's and became a director of Sotheby's in Europe. His speciality is 18th century French furniture. But in 2019, he was accepted as a seminarian and is currently studying at the Beda in Rome, um, although he is in the UK along with all the other students uh, at the moment. Over the last few years, Patrick has been running a website called Christian Art, uh, and he uh, provides a daily email, which you can sign up to, which has a piece of art which is related to the gospel of the day with a meditation. Uh, and I strongly recommend uh, you to sign up for that. Um, the, the emails are superb. Um, finally, um, the way we're going to do questions is uh, I'm going to ask you to type any questions that you have during the talk, and then I'll ask a few of them uh, at the end. And for those of you who don't know how to ask to type questions on Zoom, you'll see on your screen either three blue, either a box with three dot, dots in it, or a speech bubble. And if you click on that, you will see a box pop up. Um, and importantly, in the bottom at the bottom of the box, there's a two uh, to uh, entry. And you need to, to choose my name, David Omani, and then you can type a message, which I'll be able to see. All right, I'll pass you over to Patrick. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. we can hear you. I think I'm unmuted. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, so, good evening, and thank you very much, David, for the for the introduction. So, yes, at the I am a seminary now, and I just finished my exams middle of last week. Uh, so, uh, which which is good. We did we did the exams remotely because all of the seminarians. We're sent home from Rome uh, mid-March, uh, so here I am on based in the, at Holy Apostles Pimlico Parish Church in the centre of London. I don't know where you're all watching from, uh, but uh, I'm currently based in uh, in London. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about the importance of uh, of Christian art for the church, and I think. It will become again increasingly more and more important uh, with the new evangelization uh, in the church as one of the main tools I think to try and bring back the faith to a lot of people especially in the in the West to try and bring people back to to our to our churches so I'll give you a, a brief overview first where it actually stems from that the, the Catholic Church had always had such an interest in the arts and and, and use the arts as a major tool in order to, 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 to spread the faith. And I think let's, let's first of all uh, look at scripture. Um, so um, at scripture and, and in Genesis, so starting from, uh, from the very beginning uh, of our Bible. And in Genesis, it, it says of course that heaven and earth are created and we see God the creator god as the divine artist at work creating first uh, nature and the animals and then at the end uh, the summum which is created creating us uh, us humans man and woman uh, and i think it's a lovely image basically to 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 think of of god as as the artist creator who is sort of hand molded each of us individually and just like any artist 
paints a, when he paints a canvas, never any canvas is is the same. And I think it's the same that we humans have uh, and share that uniqueness, Zach. Every has been shaped and molded by these divine hands uh, in, 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 in a unique way. But it's, it's not really until we get to uh, scripture and, 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 and to Exodus and, and the story of Moses and leading uh, the Jewish people out of Egypt um, that, that we really get a, a further sense of, of God as that uh, divine artist who's intervening uh, and instructing Moses uh, to build a tabernacle. Uh, and I think it's a very unique passage. So when you look at Exodus 25 and Exodus uh, 31, I think that they're very much chapters which are, which are worth reading. If, if you like the arts, um, it's, it's, it's really worth having a read. If you look at Exodus 25, God is simultaneously to instructing the Ten Commandments to Moses. He's also telling Moses to build a tabernacle. And he's telling him to build a tabernacle and giving him clear instructions as to what patterns to use, what materials to use, uh, even the architecture of that tabernacle. So, uh, so God is seen as that divine uh, architect there. But the main thing that strikes me in, in these passages is in Exodus 31, where he doesn't just instruct Moses to build a tabernacle, but he actually says, who should build the tabernacle? And you have these two figures uh, of Bezalel and Oholiab, uh, who are instructed by God himself to build that tabernacle. So there is that sense of, of vocation uh, of the artist, because I think a lot, a lot of the artists, uh, I think especially nowadays in contemporary art, they just see themselves as, okay, wanting to express uh, their own feelings or personal opinions about things, uh, but we don't always sort of think of artists that it is actually a vocation. And when you go back to Exodus 31, it's very clear that God gives special talents to special people for artists to follow uh, their vocation. So these two figures that we see, they do have these special divine gifts for them to live out uh, their, their, their vocation. And what is lovely to see is that actually God is embracing all these art forms in this passage uh, of, of Exodus. So he's telling and instructing Bezalel and, and Holiab to uh, build also a golden lampstand, which is symbolic, of course, for the light of God's glory. So we have that symbolic art. And God is also... Uh, telling them to to use representation a lot, so to 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 stitch flowers onto the priest's clothes, for example, uh, or have animal representations. So also that representation a lot is there. And actually, the most interesting thing in 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 that passage is when God speaks about the again the priestly vestments, and He says. He, he, he tells Bezalel and Oholiab, he says, also on the, on the priest vestments, do stitch blue pomegranates on there. And of course, blue pomegranates don't exist. So it's a kind of an abstraction to move away from the purely representational to the, to the abstract by uh, telling them to, to, to use these blue pomegranates. And, and that is really the beginning as well, in my view, of, uh, of abstract uh, art. And I think in, in our Catholic faith, uh, we see as well by God embracing these, these different art forms already back then in Exodus. Uh, it's something that the, the, the church, that we as a church are very much taken on board, is that we do embrace all these different types of, uh, of art forms, whether it is these masterpieces from Michelangelo uh, down to, uh, say, the, 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 the small rosary, plastic rosaries or, 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 or representations that get sold uh, in, in the little sh souvenir shops in Lourdes. We, we as a church embrace sort of from the kitsch art to the, to the most sort of 
glorious forms of art and i and i think that is something to 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 be proud of i i, I think um so but if away from, from scripture and we look actually within the church which i just mentioned who are the key figures within our church that actually have led to the church to be these main drivers uh, of uh, using art uh, for, for, the, for the spreading of our faith and i think the first one and probably the most important one is saint john of damascus he's a eighth century figure so he died in 749 as you can see on the slide and he's most famous really for his victory in the iconoclast uh, controversy. So in the 8th century, what we see, we see the advent uh, of, the, of, of Islam. Uh, and also within the Christian faith, there are a lot of voices saying that actually God shouldn't be represented. Uh, and so we shouldn't have any graven images uh, of our Lord. And so the church had to come to a view, what do we do? Do we... Do, do, do we agree not to have any images or do on the contrary we embrace sort of the arts and culture and have these images uh, and that can actually help us as a tool to evangelize and saint john of damascus went back to the writings of of saint paul when you look at the writings of saint paul saint paul refers there to jesus himself as the icon uh, of god so uh, is god invisible yes is god beyond any representation yes of course however however god made an icon a picture an image in the humanity of jesus so if it's good enough for god it's good enough for us as a church so and i and i do think that that's really key in in, in looking in looking at christian art uh is is that we like an evangelization that doesn't only speak but also that shows and that goes back to saint john uh, of damascus and that our icons and our depictions and the paintings that we look at um, are in that sense participations in this primordial iconography uh of 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 God himself so without St John uh, of Damascus there wouldn't be any Michelangelo there wouldn't be any Caravaggio's uh, so he's really 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 key and a second figure in in, in our history of, 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 of the church and the arts would be St Thomas Aquinas uh, and I'm and I'm mentioning him uh, because like so many figures throughout the ages have always struggled to uh, to define art and culture and beauty and we can talk about that later um, but saint thomas aquinas tried to define beauty and what is it actually that makes something beautiful and he he basically uh, said it's the coming together of three things and then we find beauty so it's the coming together of the integritas, consonantia, and claritas. And I'll just very briefly talk about that. So the integritas is the wholeness. So if we look at this stained glass window, for example, uh, of Notre Dame uh, in Paris, is, uh, it's about one thing, the integritas. It's a stained glass window. The consonantia would be the harmony, all the individual elements when you look at it that bring it together. So you would have somebody making the stained glass, um, the, the, the little stained glass bits. You would, you would have the stonemason. You would have somebody who made the design. So it's a coming together of a lot of different skills, a lot of different thoughts, a lot of different designs. So it's that harmony, uh, which he calls consonantia. And then there is the claritas, which is that radiance that when you stand in front of it, it just oozes the splendor of the of the artwork or of the stained glass window and and then saint thomas aquinas says that's when you find uh, that's when you find beauty 
And I just mentioned Jean-Marie Lustiger there, who, uh, who, who, was, who was a Jew. And when he went into uh, Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, he saw this particular stained glass window. Uh, and that is actually what drove him to the Catholic faith and to convert to, convert to Catholicism because he was just absolutely transfixed uh, by this the, by this north window uh, at at Notre Dame, and I think these three elements you can actually you can apply them to anything. So even if when you look at sports, you would find these three same uh, components. So integritas here, there's a there's a footballer. I think it's Vincent Company, a good Belgian footballer who's um, who we see there. Uh, and so when a goal is, goal is scored, we say, oh, this is a beautiful goal. And why is it beautiful? Because A, it's about integritas. It's about one thing, scoring the goal. It's about consonancia, because it's the coming together of many individual elements, the talent, the running, the kicking of the right foot, him looking at the ball, so the coming together of these things, and then the claritas, which gives that wow effect that we think, okay, wow. This is, a, this is an absolutely uh, stunning goal. So beauty can grab us in a way beyond what words can communicate. Uh, if we look at Pope Francis, for example, I think he understands that very well. Uh, and I think he has the art of the beautiful gesture. So if we think, especially at the beginning of his pontificate, he was sending out all these signals where he was washing the feet, he was paying the bills of the hostels he was staying at. He was driving around in a, which he still is in, in a humble car. So it's, it's that beautiful gesture and that power of the image, which he is, uh, which he is uh, very aware of. Um, and yes, I, I mentioned via pulcritudinis. He's mentioned it on a few occasions that actually the way of beauty, the via pulcritudinis, is something that we as a church uh, should embrace uh, even more and use uh, more. So why do I personally think uh, that, that we have to use art again as a church to, to evangelize? And I think Hans Urs van Balthasar is a very interesting character uh, to mention because he was writing about the three transcendentals beauty, goodness, uh, and truth. And, okay, if, in case you're not familiar with what the transcendentals are, the transcendentals are, uh, they can be described in a way as the ultimate desires of men. So, so any person anywhere in the world, whatever culture, whatever background, uh, is always looking for truth, is always looking for goodness, is always looking for beauty and that, that sits beyond any culture, uh, any culture that people may have or any backgrounds that people may have. So th that's why they're called uh, the, the transcendentals. And we as a church, I think up to maybe 30, 40 years ago, uh, we, we, were, we were talking to people starting from the truth, telling, okay, well, this is God. This is what he's about. This is the Holy Spirit. This is Jesus Christ, the, the blessed Trinity. And so this is the truth. And if you believe in this truth, then you will all be good people and you will do the right thing. You will behave morally. You will do all these things. And if you do all these good things, then you will find also beauty in your life and create beauty. So the, ch the church was going from truth to goodness and beauty. And Hans Urs von Balthasar says, well, actually, and he was quite visionary because I think he said this in the 1930s or 40s. He says, nowadays, we have to go the other way around. We have to go from beauty to goodness and to truth. Because if in today's society, we, we would start by, with talking uh, about, about truth. I mean, I think people would, would basically say, well, okay, well, that's your truth, but that's not my truth. Or if we would start talking about, well, this is a good life. This is the way you should lead a good life. Again, people would just run a mile and, and, and probably rightly so. 
And beauty in that sense is a, a non-intimidating way uh, to, talk about, uh, to talk about faith. Because all you're doing is, okay, well, look at this painting or, or listen to this music. And something will happen. There will be an alchemy front with the arts. I mean, I have to, be, before I went to to, to 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 seminary in Rome in in September, uh, in the months before, because I had time, I I I, uh, I attended evening prayer at Westminster Cathedral uh, at five o'clock, and and it's often uh, the choir. Uh, which is singing there during during the week, and, and you're basically sitting uh, at the right chapel there in the front, in the midst of the choir, and it's it's it's, uh, it's it's stunning to listen to. And I made a point of trying to bring at least one friend uh, along with me a week, somebody who wasn't necessarily uh, believing. Actually, I made a point to bring someone who, who wasn't uh, a Christian or, or, or a practicing uh, Christian. And just by, by listening to the choir for 20 minutes, something happened inside nearly each of these, each of these people. So I never started talking about any, any faith stuff, uh, but yet the music made them want to talk about it the, the, themselves. And I, and I think uh, that that's what we have as a, as a church is this amazing legacy and, and it's a legacy that I that I use on on my website as well. Christian art is is just presenting these old artworks again to people um, for them uh, to, to be to, to to be in touch with and to, and to interact with. So today, as I as I as I explained, we we live, I think, more than any age in a in a in a highly uh, visual age, and I and I think when you look at young people as well they're constantly on their on their mobiles on computers on on tablets and even if they don't come to to the churches we can actually get to these people uh on their computers and 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 on their phones if if we become serious again about about uh, about imagery uh the, the new media um so i think we have to use the the internet and the arts, and actually we have all the ingredients that are already there uh, to to try and, uh, and 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 get to these people. And as I said down on the slide, I, I think why would why would we want to win the battle of the word if we're not if we are willing to lose the battle uh, of the image? And I think uh, that's sort of my short twenty twenty five minute talk that I want to. Uh, end on is is just to uh, to stress and celebrate uh, that that the image and the imagery background that we have uh, is something there to be used. Uh, but I invite you all now to 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 send in your questions because as this is just a a, br a brief introduction to to a vast topic, I'll uh, I'll be very happy and very willing to 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 answer questions. So David. Over well, I like there's three so far. Yeah. Um, the first relates specifically to something you said, and that was um, this, what is, in your view, the symbolism of the blue pomegranate? Well, the symbolism is that, it, that, it's, that it's abstraction. So the pomegranate always stands for abundance and fertility. Uh, so you see that in old master paintings as well. In still lives, that up often a cut open pomegranate, which shows all the seeds sitting inside it, uh, is shown. So that's the the general symbolism. But then it moves from the symbolic to the abstract, because it it, it moves from being a, a red pomegranate uh, to to a blue pomegranate, and 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 the blue it it just doesn't exist, and yet. Uh, God himself in his instructions to Moses gave very clear instructions to make it a blue pomegranate uh, and, and, and so in there lies uh, abstraction and in there lies as well for me the, the origins of, of abstract art and also that artists can be creative that, so that they don't just need to stick with the representational that actually they can yeah they can bring in their own feelings and emotions and creativity and 
So it, it, it gives a freedom basically to the artists. Okay, well, the second question is if, if you look at um, many of the great artists of history, that many of them have had a religious sensibility, many of them mm. produce Christian or, or religious art. Um, do you think contemporary artists have a religious sensibility at all? And if so, which ones? Ha, it's, 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 it's a very interesting one. I mean, I'm showing on the slide that you're seeing uh, now that it's, 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 a, it's a Damien Hirst uh, installation. And I know a lot of people would run a mile from what he's doing, but yet, if you look at the title of the work, it says Away from the Flock. And, and most of the titles of his works are, 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 are Christian titles. And I would love to sit down with some of these people to, to really delve into why they're using this Christian language to create their art. And yet, at the same time, they say that they, that they don't believe. So in my view, it's... It's a way that the Holy Spirit is at work in artists who don't necessarily see themselves as, as Christians, but yet they produce these things which, which, are, which, which have some very Christian uh, content. Uh, not, another example in music, for example, is, is Carl Jenkins. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with his music. Uh, a friend of mine, he's good friends with him. Uh, and he says that, that he doesn't necessarily have faith. And then you think, wow, this is absolutely extraordinary to, to create these, these magnificent pieces of music without necessarily having, uh, having a, a deep-rooted faith. And again, for me, it's a proof that, that the Holy Spirit is at work in a lot of these people. Um, so I don't think you need necessarily to be a Christian to create Christian art, um, but yeah. Anyway, that would that that would be my answer. Um, um, and someone has just asked this this question. I'll paraphrase it, uh, and this may say more about um, modern I or, or modern ideas of what beauty is. Um, but uh, the question is: is is not beauty? subjective the appreciation of beauty the the people say beauty is in the eye of the beholder um and if that's so um and i personally wouldn't accept that um uh, is that does that not create problems for evangelization because it uh as as the person said is essentially is um essentially subjective it, it, it it, it is certainly subjective, but up to a point. So there is, what I would say, there is a subjectively pleasing, which is, uh, I don't know, like I like, uh, I like macaroni and cheese, for example. That is subjectively pleasing to me, but I know that is just subjectively pleasing to me. And I wouldn't sort of tell other people or want other people to all start eating macaroni and cheese. <laughs> On the other side of the spectrum, uh, sorry, I can't just think of another example. On the other <laughs> side of the spectrum, you go from the subjectively pleasing to the, the, the objectively true, I would say, which is when you would take somebody into the Sistine Chapel uh, at the Vatican, and I would say, well, I like this, this is amazing. And if somebody would say, oh, well, it's not really, you would go like, what? I mean, this is, this is, so you, I think we all feel when, when you move from the subjectively pleasing to the objectively true. And I think, yes, there, there, there are grades sort of in between that. But, but I do think that there is, there, is, there is an objective beauty like in, 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 in the Sistine Chapel that we all feel that that artwork is tapping into, into something different, not just about ourselves, but about humanity as well and that it is an achievement uh, of humanity which some of these artworks do, do have um, and what about this follow-on question if um it, it is probably not controversial to say that many contemporary artworks are not beautiful they may be skillful they may be appealing they may be clever but they're not beautiful yes. um 
and that is a um, a trend in art which hasn't been known at least in you know hundreds and hundreds of years um, mm. do you think that speaks to a uh, death of the spiritual in contemporary society yes I, I think it's it's been on for a long time where art has become uh, more and more individualistic and I, and I think it's really from the age of romanticism in, in the late 18th century early 19th century where artists starting actually seeing themselves as being the main source uh, f of their creativity away from God away from anybody else and and I think that is culminate that has culminated in, in the last few decades where uh, yeah where, where artists really see themselves uh, as the be all and end all of, of what they create and and unfortunately a lot of it has to do with patr patronage as well so uh, if the, the art used to be sponsored by the church now the art is mainly sponsored by big sort of individual collectors or, or big uh, corporations uh, so uh, yeah but it, I, I, I think it's I think it's 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 a sad development in contemporary art but it's certainly not an irreversible development because I do see and having spoken to, 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 to contemporary artists over the years is that actually if some of them you would ask okay can you create something here in this church because they get offered the most amazing spaces to uh, to create artwork in uh, to get a show in i don't know museum of modern art in new york or the Centre pompidou in paris but actually if you if you were to say can you make something here in this particular church or cathedral but you have to talk to the parish priest to sort of work in tandem to see what you will create most artists even the biggest artists would be would would love to do it because it's in their nature as well of artists to to be challenged uh, and i think when they stay in that realm of the contemporary art world there are very few challenges left for them so if we were to step in as a church and offer them a very exciting projects i th i think i think there could be a, an incredible dynamic dialogue that could be established again because the same could be said, just as a comment to wrap that up, about contemporary classical music or contemporary poetry. It might be clever, but it's not beautiful in the way that um, in former times. Um, the next, the the um, uh, I'll combine two questions. Um, someone has asked um, if there is an implied theology in contemporary art. Um, how how do you discover that? Um, and I suppose the linked question is how in practical terms do you use art for the purposes of evangelization? Uh, wow, they're very, they're very big questions. I think the theological... <laughs> the you asked for it. <laughs> I've, only won, I've only done one year of theology, so that's a very hard one to, uh, uh, to, 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 to answer, to be perfectly honest. And I don't think I could give an adequate answer uh, to, to, to that question. Um, I, I do think as a, as a church, as, a, as I said before, we, we, society and especially the younger generation is incredibly visually driven. Uh, more than pushing any words in front of them or any scripture or prayers or whatever, I think by pushing uh, the right images uh, underneath their noses, so to speak, uh, I, I, I think we, we, we would stand a chance to, to, to get some of these people back. And, and I'm not just saying this as a kind of a romantic, impossible idea. I do, I do think it's very, very, very real and very tangible. Um, like what I do uh, with, with Christian art and the daily emails that get sent out, they reach all sorts of places. Uh, there are 15,000 readers now every day. Some people forward it to their friends or share it on Facebook or whatever. So I get about 20, 30 emails from people who say, oh, wow, that was really an amazing work of art. And it's often engaging with, I don't know, a medieval artwork or a contemporary artwork. Uh, so I think, A, the first source of material 
to use would be what we have as a church is our, our, our sort of Christian art legacy uh, that we have and, and represented in, in, in a fresh and innovative way. And I think that that's, that's the first tool and battle that we can win. So I don't think we have to reinvent the wheel to start commissioning all sorts of artworks left, left right and center. Uh, That unfortunately, the, 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 most of the, the Christian art, strictly speaking, that gets produced by, 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 by Christian artists or who call themselves Christian artists, a lot of it is not really that, that good or that impressive or, or that even t t talks or speaks, speaks to me. Uh, it can be very, I mean, beautiful and very pious images. Uh, but I don't think necessarily images that would that would speak to 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 a wider to a wider audience. Um, then, thirdly, I would also say is that, is that, is that not just using art but also photography. We have to be clever, so that when we as a as a church on our on our parish websites, on our church communications, uh, on everything, we, we have to be very careful in the images that we that we choose. So not just have, I don't know, a photograph of a field of corn or photograph of, of flowers or whatever to make these uh, our websites appeal to people. No, we have to really think uh, what, it, what images uh, that we put there. So, so I think the awareness has to start first with ourselves to actually have a think about what are the images that we use to, to sort of push out to the weeds. I don't know if that sort of answers part of it. All right. Well, um, the question is still coming in, but I'll, 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 I think if, I, if we have another two or three, yeah. um, one is, uh, it follows on from what you've just said. Um, and one person has made the comment that, that churches generally seem mm. to choose um, soulless art, or, you know, what they, which the person is called trendy, art um but the other and the other question linked to that is um are there in your view any great christian artists at the moment hmm. and if so who are they <laughs> uh any great christian uh, artists well I, i'm afraid to say that most of my, my my most of the artists i would mention would be artists that are not necessarily christian but i think they produce amazing Christian art. I think Bill Viola, uh, for example, he's he's a video artist from the 1990s all the way up to now. Where he, he's producing the most amazing uh, video artwork. So I think he's worth Googling and having a look at. Uh, like one of the works I'm thinking of is he, he created a work called The Resurrection, another one, Ascension. So again, very Christian titles. Uh, and, and that's very beautiful uh, artwork. Uh, I, um, I'm just trying to think who else would be worth uh, looking at. Let me let me have a think. I'll I'll come back. Uh, that, but but your the way you've answered that question may in fact be the clearest answer. Yes. Um. No. <laughs> yeah. No. But I I I, th I think one. Because if the there were, it would it would have be it would be an easy answer to to uh, find yes correct correct yeah uh, and the final question is very specific do you think that a rothko is a spiritual artist well you have a spiritual experience when when you're sitting uh, in in the rothko room i think probably the the person who, who asked the question is thinking of the rothko room at the at tate modern uh, so yes, I do think you have a spiritual experience when you are sitting amongst these huge canvases. Uh, but then those canvases were made initially for a restaurant uh, and not for a church. Uh, but yes, they, they, they do give a, a, a sense of spirituality. Uh, I wouldn't call it necessarily spiritual art, but like with so many things, uh, the, the, his canvases are an invitation into... I don't know, whatever it is, meditation or, 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 or spirituality and why not? And like any of the artworks, 
any art is only an invitation to go beyond and to, to, to help you to pray and to help you find God. It's never the end in itself. Okay, well, um, thank you very much, uh, Patrick. That was a fantastic uh, um, talk and thank you for answering people's questions. Uh, and I would really encourage anyone who hasn't already done so to sign up for the daily emails because they really are, I think, superb. Um, and even my mother and all her friends have signed up <laughs> as well as lots of other people. Uh, and so it's all over Australia as well. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much, Patrick. And thank you, everybody, for dialing in. Thank you, David. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.